God, for everything that you've done for us, for all that you've given us, for all the ways that you work in our lives, we give you thanks. And we just ask that in these moments you'll be at work in our hearts and our minds so that we might hear and understand what it is that you have to say to us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's one thing that I've observed about the church over time, and that's that everyone loves the idea of resurrection. We love the idea of resurrection. We celebrate it on Easter. I say, Christ is risen, and people say? Very good. All right. So I say that. You respond. You know, everybody knows the drill. We talk about new life, and we talk about fresh starts, and we talk about God's power to overcome anything and everything in our lives. But, uh, you know, resurrection is... I guess you'd say it's the signature proclamation of Christianity. We love the idea of resurrection right up to the point when we realize, wait a minute, in order to celebrate a resurrection, there first has to be a funeral. We're very excited about resurrection up until the point when we realize that. And that's when we realize that maybe resurrection isn't everything that it's cracked up to be. Paul says in this passage uh, from his letter to the Philippians, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection by becoming like him in his death. Now Paul gets it. Now, as we've said in the past couple of weeks as as we've been talking about this letter, Paul literally was facing death. When he wrote these words, he was in prison in Rome, and he was uh, soon to be tried and in fact executed for proclaiming the gospel. And so he was thinking, and you see this throughout the text of the letter, that he was thinking very much in terms of life and death. And he was also taking stock of everything that he'd experienced up to that point. And he was kind of counting up his gains and his losses. And he says, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So, to Paul, there's nothing that really compares with knowing Jesus, with knowing Christ's power in his life. Whatever came before, it's like nothing to him. Now, I've preached this passage uh, at least about three or four times in my life. So, I've gotten this out, and I don't know whether intentionally or not. Um, I know the first time was intentional. Uh, The first sermon that I ever preached was on this passage. So, in January of uh, 2000. And I've reached for it again at kind of key times in the, my life or in the lives of the churches that I've pastored. And it seems to me that on all the occasions when I preached it, they all had something in common. Those represented kind of inflection points, places where the curve was changing, where something was happening that was new. Certainly that was true when I preached my first sermon is I was thinking about changing careers. And it was true again in my last church, I realized that the day that I preached from this text was the day that we started a new worship service and a totally new style on Sunday morning. It was the first day of a new schedule, kind of the first day of a new start in the life of that church. And those were all exciting times. They were times full of promise and they were times full of hope. But, and you knew that there had to be a but there somewhere, right? They were also times of loss. There were times when we felt like we were burying something else, something that was important to us, something that was good. We love the idea of a resurrection, but we're not 100% sure how we feel about the idea of a funeral. Not sure about that. I certainly wasn't quite sure about how I felt about letting go of being an engineer to become a pastor. All I'd wanted to be for at least 10 years was an engineer. That was a word, you know. We think in terms of, um, I don't know, at least for me, throughout my life, there have been just words that represented goals that I was was working towards, right? And for 10 years, that was the word. That was the goal. Um, One of my work colleagues, when I left, uh, gave me a certificate. It said, Creativity Award, presented to Joe Monaghan for the most creative escape plan. That's what it said. When we started our second Sunday service in the last church that I served in Succasana, there was a fair amount of resistance to that idea. 
Uh, making changes to a worship schedule is a painful thing. Nobody likes it. Very few people appreciate it. And by and large, there are always people who are going to be unhappy no matter what you do. But you know who pushed back actually the most on the whole thing? It wasn't the people whose a normal Sunday was going to be disruptive. Uh, we took one service and we moved it back half an hour. And it wasn't the folks who were in that service that was moving back half an hour. It's actually the people who had started the service that we were moving to Sunday morning on a Saturday night. We had started the service on a Saturday night, and we were picking it up, and we were moving it to Sunday morning. It was the people who got used to worshiping on Saturday night and who had been with this from the beginning. Even though I kept saying, you know what, this is not going to grow on Saturday night. We need to move it to Sunday morning. And, but it was those folks who actually were the most resistant to the change because they loved that small group of people that they had found, and they felt loyalty to them. So even though ultimately we did what needed to be done, you know, we love the idea of resurrection, but we hate the idea of the funeral. We hate the idea of the loss that it's going to take to get to the resurrection. So we're always looking for the gain, but very seldom do we want to take into account the losses. And Paul spoke that way of his own spiritual experience. In his letters, one of the themes that comes through in almost every letter is this ongoing conflict in the church. It was kind of what defined Paul's ministry, this ongoing conflict in the church between Christians who came from the Jewish tradition and Christians who came from outside the Jewish tradition, so Gentile Christians. And so some people were preaching that in order to be a Christian, first you had to become a Jew. You could become a Jew first, and then you could become a Christian. But um, that represented an obvious and very painful challenge in a very literal way to Gentiles because you had a lot of Gentile men facing circumcision without anesthesia, right? Not a real popular way to grow a faith. And so that represented this obvious and really painful challenge. Paul completely rejected the notion that you had to be a Jew first in order to be a Christian. He had seen the work of God in enough people's lives to understand that's not necessarily how it had to be. That circumcision and keeping the law were things that were neither here nor there. He says that if one's ability to keep a set of rules was the defining thing, the defining part of faith, he says, well, you know what? I was more faithful than anyone. I was more faithful than any of them who want to preach that to you. And so he talks about his pedigree, he talks about where he came from, he talks about how he stuck to the plan, how he did all that was expected of him by everyone, including, he thought, God. He lived by the law, and he taught according to what was the strictest interpretation of the law, the Pharisaic interpretation. So he was among this group of people that called themselves Pharisees. And I'm sure much of what he learned and did and taught as a Pharisee was good. The fact that he was out stoning Christians in his spare time, not so good. But by and large, I'm sure that there were a lot of positive things that he took away from his experience. Things that served him well in years to come. And that's where the challenge comes. I mean, it's one thing for us to talk about having a funeral for things in our lives that we know are not good for us. It's one thing for us to talk about a resurrection after putting to bed something like an addiction. I mean, that was something you needed to have a funeral for, else maybe you were facing your own funeral, literally. It's one thing to talk about something that really wasn't working for you to begin with and say, you know what, I need to bury this. But it's a totally different thing to bury something that's been important to you and that has been working for you, but that might not be exactly what you need to go to the next place that God is calling you. Those are the funerals that, by and large, we are not ready to have at all. So Paul was ready to bury his spiritual experience of his life as a Pharisee. He was ready to leave it behind, even though there was, like I said, a lot of good in it. But how about us? How about us as a church? I mean, let's think about this. The thing that brought us through the past 40 years, the things that we have done that have brought us through the past 40 years that helped us to move from 
the location, our original location, our original place of worship on Branch Street out to this location, which is brand new 40 years ago, when there was really not very much around here. You know, those things that helped us through that time are not the same things that will help us through the next 40 years. We might want them to be, but they're not. They're not the same things that will enable us to continue to reach children of, say, Braden's generation, even though we want them to be. Because the world has changed, and the culture has changed, and the neighborhood has changed, and we have changed. And so we need to be willing to admit that and to bury things that need to be buried in order to move forward. Programs and traditions and ways of thinking that aren't working for us now and into the future. And no doubt, there will be some things in that that we will have to bury that will have been very important to us and that feel really painful to let go of. But whether we like it or not, there comes a time when certain things have to be buried. Because in order to have a resurrection, you first have to have a funeral. And that's true, too, in our individual lives. There are things about us that are great, wonderful things. Things that have gotten us to the place where we are. But that get in the way of our pursuit of Christ. And that's the language that Paul uses. He says, I press on to claim all that Jesus has in store for me. I press on to make it my own, he says, because Jesus has made me his own. Now, I don't know what that is for you. It might be a kind of independence, maybe something that you've always prided yourself on, is I don't need anybody's help. Maybe that's served you very well in your life up to this point. But perhaps that's left you spiritually kind of empty because it leaves no room to be in community with other people to learn to rely on other people, to understand what it means to have other people pray for you when you need it, to come beside you and help you when you need it. Or it might be this kind of pure rationality, which has served you very well to get you to this place in your life that you are now, because you've dealt with the world always just as you found it, believed only in what you could see, and there's an admirable quality in that because oftentimes that's the thing that allows you to make a decision that no one else can make. It makes you able to rise above all the emotions of a situation to be able to make a clear-headed and right decision. The unfortunate thing is that it doesn't leave a lot of room for the mystery and the power of God. It doesn't leave you a lot of room to experience God's work in your life. So the things that got us to the places where we are are sometimes exactly the things that hold us back from taking the next step of faith. Now, I'm not saying that rationality or independence are bad things. I don't mean that at all. But when we define ourselves by certain traits and characteristics and certain ideas and certain words, then we need to, in order to be able to take the next step, we need to be willing to bury those things, to let them go, at least in some degree, to have a funeral for them, to be able to write them off in order to gain Christ and be found in him, to use Paul's words. So the Christian life looks back to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness toward us. It looks back not to lament about how much better things used to be, or how we wish we could go back there. Instead, it always looks forward to the future. It always looks forward to what God is doing now and what God will do next. And so, again, to close with Paul's words, we press on, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, pressing on toward the goal, the call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.